How's everybody doing this morning? Doing good? I don't know how you could be doing bad after that. Y'all are so much fun to come to church with. If you would, please turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter number 14. You know, I think I'd come here even if I had a choice. You know what I'm saying? To be with y'all, singing, worshiping together. There's nothing like it. I don't believe that we should take any Sunday for granted where we're able to come into God's house together and be in his presence. But while you're turning to Matthew chapter number 14, just a brief review of last week, we talked about being the one, being willing to do what nobody else is willing to do, being willing to be obedient even when it isn't convenient. How many of y'all this week began to pray and ask God who he would have you bring with you on the 28th? Two of you. Wow. Well, that message was effective. Dad, you ever feel like you're in a room and it's like you're in a conversation with yourself and it's like you're talking? Well, prayerfully today will be a little more effective and have some application to it out of Matthew chapter number 14. If you would, please turn there. Chapter 14, and we'll start at verse number 22. And this is a very popular, well-known passage of Scripture. Uh, whether you've been in church your whole life or if you've never been in church before today, you've probably heard some semblance of this story told out of Matthew chapter 14. This is also a passage that I would not encourage you to replicate uh, because this is the story of Peter walking on water. And I've known some people in my life that actually tried to do what Peter did and failed miserably. I encourage you not to try it yourself. But Jesus has just fed the 5,000. And he's gone away. He's leaving. He's gone to the mountainside to pray. And he sends away the disciples starting in verse number 22. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. And while he dismissed the crowd... And after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. I want to stop right there and just point out how important it is that we pour our lives into so many other people, but it's equally as important that we take time to pour into ourselves. Notice that Jesus has just spent the past hours pouring out into the people, the 5,000 plus people, and he says, I need to get alone. I need to get some time to refuel for myself. Don't. Don't spend your whole life giving out to everybody else without getting refueled from God. Amen? Amen. Even as pastors, it's important that they, even though they pour out on Sunday mornings, that they take time on Monday mornings to refuel and to get re-energized themselves. Because we spend so much time pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, that there's nothing left to give. And Jesus knew the importance of being alone with his Father. It says he went alone later that night. And he was there alone, and the boat, in verse 24, was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, and when the disciples saw him, they cr cried out in fear, it's a ghost. But Jesus said immediately to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and then Peter got out of the boat walked on water and came toward Jesus. Now, if I'm Peter, I am not getting out of the boat, but Peter just jumps out. Notice he didn't even flinch. He didn't even take time because he had already noticed the importance, as we talked about last week, of immediate obedience. He had already seen what could take place when you would obey Jesus without any questions, when you would just jump out. So Peter's like, okay, you told me to come? All right. I'm going to jump out. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't think about it. He's seen the supernatural that can happen. He's seen the blessings that can take place. He's seen the spiritual growth. And so he just hops out. But in verse 30, it says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Anybody in here ever had an uh-oh moment? Like a sudden burst of faith. And then it kind of fizzled out and you were like, what am I doing? Or you had a sudden burst of faith and you said something without thinking about it and now you're actually having to follow up on that action. Peter's here and he's having an uh-oh moment. He was known for these. He even talked about it himself later in his life that he was known for having sudden burst of faith to do great things and then it fizzled out. 
That's why he told Jesus, I'll never deny you. I'll fight to the death. I will not deny you. And then a couple of days later, he's denying him three times. So he says, he starts to see what's going on and he starts to fall. But then in verse 31, immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And then they climbed in the boat and the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. I want to talk to you for the next few moments this morning on overcoming moments of faith that fail. Anybody in here who's ever had a leap of faith in your life that was unsuccessful can identify. Any of you who have been walking on water since you were born, you could take a nap. But anybody who's tried some things that you didn't finish, intended some things that you didn't execute, tried to believe some things that you started to doubt, I want to talk to you about the moments in our life that fail and how to overcome them. And I want to talk to you on week two of BYSSIW on the subtitle, Just Get Out. Just get out. Tell your neighbor, just get out. Just get out. Let's pray one more time real quick. God, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in your house this morning. I thank you for giving us this privilege. I pray that you'd help us not to take the next few moments lightly. And I pray that you would ready each and every one of our hearts. Take away preconceived ideas. Take away preconceived notions. Help us to focus solely on what you have to say to us today. Lord, I pray that you would put me on like a coat and wear me. I pray that they would not see me, that they would not hear me, but that they would see and hear from you this morning. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you have ever tried to impress somebody that you were dating or that you wanted to date or maybe you were married to? You've tried to impress somebody. Let me see your hand. Everybody's hand should be up. Some of y'all are like, well, I just like being myself. Well, you may be yourself, but you're going to step your game up a little bit to try to be impressive because I hate to break it to you. You alone is not that impressive. So we try to step up our game right and do some things how many of you now would be more honest probably going to have more men here than women would say that you tried to impress someone you were dating wanted to date or you were married to and you failed miserably can i see your hand like you fell flat on your face every man in here has his hand raised i don't know why it's just a thing yeah so we've all done that and kristen and i have been married for for three years now uh this past wednesday we've been yeah, give it up for her. She's put up with me for three years. That's a big deal. And so we've been married for three years. We've been together for over six. And I've always tried to impress her, and I haven't stopped. But last night, just last night, we went to bed. We got to bed at 8.30, okay? Now, we were so excited just to be able to go to bed at 8.30. That just shows, I'm not saying we're old, because I know some of y'all get all tense when I say that. But I think when you get excited about going to bed early, you might be getting older than you were. And so on a Saturday night, we went to bed at 8.30, and we, just, we were just so excited. At 10.49, though, we have a boxer and a chihuahua. The boxer does not bark until she sees something, even though she's supposed to be the guard dog. The chihuahua barks as soon as he hears something. And so at 10.49, we hear, Ruff. 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 I was like, Bentley, stop. And then Kristen goes, no, hold on, hold on. I was like, what? And we heard, poof, poof, poof. it sounded like somebody was trying to break into the basement to Kristen. <laughs> to me, it sounded like thunder. I was like, babe, <laughs> you know, I think it's thunder. She's like, no, somebody's trying to get in the basement doors. And I was like, gosh, I, she was like, look at the radar, look at the radar. So I look at the radar and unfortunately there were no clouds or anything on the radar. So I was like, oh my goodness. So she was like, are you going to do something about it? And I said, I am doing something about it. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm being the priest of the home. I'm going to lay here and pray. <laughs> and so we keep hearing it. We keep hearing. Boom. Boom. And, and the longer we hear it, I start getting a little nervous because you know how it is. Somebody plants a little seed in your head, so then it starts to grow. And so I'm thinking, oh, man, somebody is trying to get in the basement. And we wanted to put wood across the doors so that they couldn't push into them, but we didn't. So, you know, I'm freaking out. So I'm like, okay, fine. And I had this sudden burst of I'm going to show her that I'm the man of the house. And I'm like, okay, babe, you know what? You know what? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. You stay here. 
If you hear anything, you run to the closet, you take your phone, and you call 911. But I got this. I got this. I'm under control. It's under control. Don't you worry. And so I got up, and I ran out of the room, and I forgot to get my gun. Some of y'all are like, I believe in gun control. Well, I do too. I have a gun, and I control. So I forgot to grab my gun, and I go running out of the room. And as soon as I stepped out, I was like, oh, my gosh, I forgot my gun. But I can't go back now because then Chris is going to think something's wrong, and I'm showing her, like, I am the man of the house. And so I go out, and I'm walking all, you know, I'm like, I'm all, you know, going, and I'm halfway asleep. And I go over, and I keep hearing it and, and, and hearing it. And so I was like, okay, and she doesn't know that I got this freaked out, and she's not in here right now, so y'all just don't tell her. So I'm like, okay, okay. So we have lights on the back of our house that shine over the basement doors, and I flickered them on and off, on and off, on and off, because I'm thinking if somebody's out there, that's going to scare them away, right? And so I do it, and then I heard I silence for a minute, and then I heard boom, and I went, oh, my God, and I took off running. But as soon as I got to the bedroom door, I stopped, and I just walked on in. She was like, what was it? I was like, I don't know, but they're gone now. I, you know, as if my shadow scared them away, right? And so she said, well, well, did you check the basement? I said, no. I said, do you want me to check the basement? She said, no, no, I don't want you to get hurt. I was like, thank you, Jesus, because I was not going down in that basement. I was not going down. But I had this sudden burst of faith. I was like, I'm going to show her I'm the man. But as soon as I heard something and I actually got outside of the room and I was by myself, I started to question everything that I had said I was going to do. You see, a lot of times God is wanting us to do some things that aren't really that difficult. But because of our comfort zone and our preconceived ideas and the things that we're used to and the people around us, we get out there and we stop short of the miracle that Jesus has for us. Then there are times when we feel like because we're even in a storm at all that we have messed up too many times and that Jesus is no longer with us. That God's no longer there. That I've messed up too many times. And the reason we think this is because we were taught it. We hear things like the safest place in the entire world is in the will of God. In theory, that is true. To be outside of God's will is a dangerous place. But it's problematic for us because we feel like we're obeying God. We feel like we're doing what God's told us to do. And we're facing some trials and some tribulations and some turbulence along the way. And so then we begin to question everything that we've been doing. But if you look back at verse number 22, it says immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Now, I point that out for you because it doesn't sound like they had very much choice. It says Jesus made the disciples go to the other side. And I wanted to point that out real quick because I wanted you to see that Jesus made them get into a boat that he knew was headed into trouble. He made them get into a boat that he knew was headed for a storm. And I pointed that out because if I didn't point that out, then anytime you or I face any trials or we feel the boat begin to rock, we may automatically think that it's the devil. But the first thing you have to see this morning on your notes is that just because it's hard, it does not mean that it's not of God. Just because it's hard, it doesn't mean that it's not of God. Bold obedience generally triggers some opposition. Just because it's hard, it doesn't mean that it's not of God. So I will say, though, that that doesn't mean that we never cause our own problems. We never cause our own storms. Sometimes out of our disobedience, out of our stubbornness, we may cause our own problems. But just because it's hard, it does not mean that it's not of God. Just because your marriage has been difficult and you don't feel it anymore does not mean that God wants you to quit your marriage. Just because the winds are blowing up against your marriage, it doesn't mean that God wants you to just jump out and jump ship and give up. Just because your children are not acting the way that you want them to act, it does not mean that God wants you to withdraw yourself as a parent and stop investing yourself. Just because it's hard, it doesn't mean that it's not of God. And it's a dangerous place for us to get when we pray and we ask God for a blessing 
or we ask him for some things and then he gives them to us and in the middle of the blessing, in the middle of the will of God, we fall into some troubles and we begin to doubt what God's told us. And so then we start trying to give God back what we prayed and asked him to give us in the first place. We prayed and we said, God, I need this and, and I need this and I need more responsibility on my job so I can make more money. And I need a bigger house so I can have a family and I need greater finances and I need, and I need all these things. And then we get those things and then it gets hard because, you know what, more money means more responsibility on your job. And we start questioning everything and we say, God, I don't want this anymore. I don't want these things. It's a dangerous place to get when we begin to doubt the things that God has placed into our lives. And we begin to say, God, I don't even want it anymore. But just because it's hard, it does not mean that it's not of God. Look at verse 28. It says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, if I'm Peter and I need a sign that it's God, this is not what I would ask for. I would not ask him to tell me to jump out of the boat. This is Jesus. Here's what I would ask. If it's really you, stop this storm right now. Isn't that how we pray? God, if it's you, take away my problems. God, if you're there, take away my situations. God, if you're there, make it easy. God, if it's really you, if you really love me, Give me a job by Monday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. It's done in Jesus' name. Where's my job? God, where are you at? You sleeping? What's going on? God, if you really love me, if you're really leading me, if you really care about me, send me a woman. Not just any woman, though. Let me tell you the specifics. I want the face of so-and-so. We started listing our specifics. God, if you love me, send me a woman. God, the next woman that comes through the door is my wife. I thank you in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus, no. No. Door number two. Door number two. That's how we pray, though. God, if it's you, do it for me right now. If you're with me, make my situation better. If you're with me, make me understand everything. If you're leading me, make it easy. Make it simple. Make it better. But you see, G uh, Peter, he doesn't ask for a sign. And he doesn't get one. He doesn't ask for improved conditions. That's how we like to think that Jesus shows up in our lives. Is a sign and improved conditions. But what Peter asks says a lot about Peter, but it says even more about the nature of God. Because it says that he said, if it's you, tell me to come. Tell me to come. He asked for a command. He asked for a command. If it's you, tell me to come. Tell me to do something. See, we like to read Matthew 14 and the story of Peter walking on water. And we like to talk about how Peter took his eyes off Jesus. And don't take your eyes off Jesus, you'll start to sink. But the way that I read it, Peter was the only one who was willing to get out of the boat. Peter was the only one who was willing to do what nobody else would do so that he could experience what nobody else could experience. What would happen in our lives if we stopped asking God for a guarantee and started asking him for a command? If we started asking God for a word, for an instruction, for a guideline, something to do, something to be led to do. See, Peter was willing to get out of the boat on just one word. Just one word. Lord, if it's really you, tell me. Anybody ever felt that way before? Like, if this decision, if, if this marriage is supposed to be the way it is, if, if we're supposed to have children, if, if we're supposed to take this job, if I'm supposed to do this business deal, if I'm supposed to do this, God, if it's you in this situation, tell me. Lord, how do I know that it's really you? How do I know that you're really there? But we have to learn from Peter, the second thing on your notes, is that the only way to find out is to step out. The only way to find out is to step out. See, unless Peter stepped out of the boat, he would have never known 
for sure if it was Jesus. And he would have never been able to walk on water. The only way to find out is to step out. I'm looking for somebody this morning who's been saying, God, how do I know that it's your will? How do I know that you're in this situation? How do I know that you'll help me? How do I know that you'll bless me? How do I know that you'll protect me? How do I know that you'll provide for me? The only way to find out is to step out. Tell your neighbor, you got to step out to find out. You have to step out to find out. So Peter gets out of the boat. He's the only one. And he goes walking. He's walking on water. He's not walking on water per se, though, because people don't do that. He's walking on a word. C-O-M-E, come. He's walking on a word of what Jesus had said to him. God, because you said so, I will. God, because you said so, I'll get out of the boat. Because you said so, I'll be obedient even though it's not convenient. Because you said so, I'll get out of my comfort zone. Because you said so, I'll leave my familiarity. Because you said so, I'll ignore what everybody else is trying to tell me. And I'll do what you told me to do simply because you said so. I want to know if there's anybody here today who is willing to listen and move at the command of your Savior even when you cannot see Him because of the circumstances of your condition. That even when you cannot see him, Peter says, Jesus, I can't see you, but I can hear you. I can't feel you, but I can hear you. And if it's you, tell me to come. Peter went walking on a word. And as long as he walked on that word, he was fine. No problems. Everything was awesome. But as soon as he saw something that contradicted what Jesus said... He began to slip. Same thing happens to you. Same thing happens to me. We get out there. And we're doing it. We're living the life God wants us to live. We're being obedient. We're following what he's telling us to do. We're trying to do everything right. But then something happens. We're trying to love somebody. But they're not loving us back. And so then the wave begins to feel bigger than the word. We're trying to forgive somebody because God said we ought to forgive. But then something happens that rips that wound back open. And we feel unforgiveness start to rock the boat a little bit. And start to creep in. And it seems a little greater than the word that God's given us. God told us that we ought to focus on his word. On his command. And we're trying to do that. But then the words of everybody else that's still in the boat start causing doubt to slip into our minds. And so then we begin to wonder, can I even do what God's wanting me to do? But you see, anytime you step out and do something great for God, everybody who was too afraid and stayed in the boat will tell you why you can't do it. Anytime you start to obey God and to be the one to get outside of the boat, Everybody in the boat will start saying the only reason you're walking on water is because you can't swim. The only reason you're walking on water is just all kinds of different things. But you can't really do it. You can't keep it up. You can't keep doing what God's told you to do. The only thing that matters is the word that God has spoken to your life. The command, the thing that he's told you. Nothing else matters. And here's what you have to do. When the waves start raging... When you begin to feel the boat start to rock a little bit, when you begin to feel your circumstances getting difficult, when you feel your situation getting hard, here's what you have to do. You have to, last thing on your notes, do the thing that you think you cannot do. You have to do the thing that everybody else has told you that you can't do, that you're not that you're not mature enough, that you don't know enough about, that you don't have all the answers, that you aren't strong enough, that you're not educated enough. You have to do the thing that everybody else said and that you've told yourself that you cannot do. You have to be obedient even when it isn't convenient. You have to be obedient even when it seems impossible, even when it's hard, even when you don't have all the answers. You have to be obedient no matter what goes on around you. See, it's amazing to me because one thing, we can wake up in the morning having a great day, everything's going perfect, And then one thing can completely wipe it out. We can wake up more on fire for God than ever. 
We're going to go and we're going to do everything God's telling us to do. And then one little thing just takes it out for the whole day. One thing on the news. One reaction that somebody else gives us. One thing that somebody else says to us just takes our victory and we're just wiped out for the rest of the day. That's why I don't think that this passage is a story about seasons of faith that fail. I think it's about moments of faith that fail. The moments. The moment where God gives you a word. And you're faced with a word and some waves. And you're having to make a decision of which one you're going to believe. The word or the waves. But what God wants you to know is that it may be easy to follow a word from God when there's no waves. It may be easy to follow a word from God when you can see him in the midst of your situation. But what God wants you to know today is that even when you can't see him, even when you cannot feel him because of the storm that's going on around you, his word still stands. His word is still supreme and he is still there with you. And what I love about God is that if you will obey him and if you will just get out of the boat, even if you fail, he's still with you. Even if you slip, he's still with you. God is there to pick you back up every time that you fall. Look at verse 30 in closing. It says, Peter was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter stepped out in faith. He stepped out on a word. But then he allowed his circumstances to be more prevalent than the word that God had spoken and the one who was standing in front of him. But look at what happens. Peter cries out and in verse 31. It says, immediately, immediately, not after Peter learned a lesson, not after Peter had to struggle some more to learn. Not after Peter found out the hard way. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And then when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. The storm stopped. The storm was completely gone. Peter took a step of faith. He got outside of the boat. And he was doing okay, but then he slipped. But that's not the end of the story. Because Jesus, when he cried out, reached down, picked him up, put him back into the boat, and the storm completely stopped. And then they said, when they, those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. See, you may be here today, and you've never gotten outside of the boat. Because you're too afraid, because you're too uncertain, because you're too comfortable inside of the boat. But maybe you are here today and you have gotten outside of the boat. But as soon as you got out, the storm intensified. It seemed to get a little more difficult. And so your circumstances caused you to slip. And the devil crept in and he told you it's over. This is as far as you'll ever get. This is as good as it'll ever be. You've messed up too many times. You've made too many mistakes. You've failed too many times. This is as far as it goes. But I came to tell somebody today that Jesus has seen your faith. He's seen you get out of the boat. He's seen you be the one. He's seen you be obedient even when it isn't convenient. And he is reaching down. He is waiting on you to just cry out and say, God, I need you. God, I have to help. I have to have your help. I don't know how to do this on my own. And he's waiting to reach down. He has not left you. You are not forsaken. You are not on your own. He is right there beside you all along. All he needed you to do was have enough faith to get out of the boat. To get out of the boat. Tell your neighbor, get out. Get out. Get out. Just get out. You don't have to get out and moonwalk across the water. You just got to get out. Just have enough faith to get out and know that God is with you all along. Even if you can't see him. Even if you can't feel him. I know what it's like some days to wake up and feel like God's not there. But I have to tell you today that even if you can't feel it, he's still there. Even if you can't see it, he's still good. And he's still God. And he still reigns supreme in your life. Would you stand with me please?